Luke chapter 6, Luke chapter 6. We're going through Acts a lot faster than Luke. Don't know if you've noticed that or not. We're only in Luke 6. We're more than twice that far into Acts. But there's so much here in Luke chapter 6 about our great Savior. Tonight we're looking at the subject of supernatural love. Supernatural love. As believers, we can have supernatural love. The world has no clue. And at the same time, supernatural love can be hard, as we will see tonight. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 36. Let us bow our heads together and ask God's help and direction. Father, thank you for your blessing throughout today. <clears throat> so good to be in the house of the Lord with God's people, singing your praises, testifying of your greatness, goodness, miraculous power. Uh, you are our awesome and great God. We ask that you might meet with us right now in a very special way once again. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me for the message tonight as we uh, look at some very strong uh, words by our Savior and his, his teaching indeed. We use that word, it was radical teaching, unusual teaching, not like anyone else had ever taught or preached. We ask that you might direct our steps as we look at this tonight. And uh, may we be able to practice uh, the words of our Savior. And we ask, Lord, that indeed, uh, that, that this would turn people to Christ. That uh, seeing us as very, very different from those that are lost. So we ask for your help and your direction. Only you can do that tonight. And we ask you to do that. So come in power, glory. You teach us tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you remember the Phil Donahue show? A lot of you. Phil Donahue, he is now 86 years old. I looked it up to make sure he was still with us. And uh, we need to be praying for his soul. He had the longest running talk show on television. In his book, he indicts God the Father for sending his son and not himself to the cross. Can you imagine that? He said, if God the Father is so all-loving, why didn't he come down and go to Calvary? Then Jesus could have said, this is my Father in whom I am well pleased. How could an all-knowing, all-loving God allow his Son to be murdered on a cross in order that he might redeem my sin. That is uh, quite an accusation to throw out there. Well, Donahue, not being saved, does not understand the Trinity at all. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not separate individual gods. It is three gods in one. Three persons. And in their three persons, they are co-equal and co-eternal. There is unity of thought in which there is absolutely no disagreement. They agree totally. The decision to send Jesus to die for our sins was a Trinitarian decision. A gift of costly love and a pain shared by all three persons of the Trinity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. For God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son. The Father makes the most costly sacrifice. The massive statement in the Bible is that God is love. If you keep your finger there in Luke and run back to 1 John chapter 4 for a moment. 1 John chapter 4. In 
1 John chapter 4, there is a lot said about the word love. At some point uh, in my life, I underlined the word love here in, in chapter 4, and there's an awful lot of red ink. But I just want to look at two verses in 1 John 4, verse number 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. That is why he could send his son to be murdered on a cross to redeem us from our sins. The love of Jesus is a radical, revolutionary love. Leviticus 19.18 says, Love your neighbor as yourself. That's not just a New Testament truth and principle. Jesus said that if you fulfill the whole law... You, if you would fulfill the whole law, you could love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus goes farther than that. He says, love your enemies as you love yourself. Love your enemies. Now, Jesus did that in the upper room. <clears throat> He washes the disciples' feet, then he takes bread and dips it in the common bowl, and he offers it to Judas. He expressed his love for the one who was set on turning him in, on betrayal. And Jesus, one last time, tenderly tries to reach Judas and get him back to lift bread and dip it in the common bowl and to offer it to somebody else was a gesture of friendship, special friendship. Judas, you do not have to do this. But he went through with his plan. And in that amazing and emotional moment, Jesus demonstrated his new law of love. The call to love one's enemies. Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another and reach out to your enemies. This is the call of Jesus to the church as well. This is what Jesus did on the cross. He embraced the whole world. He embraced his enemies. He died for sinners the ungodly for every enemy that he had and will ever have. Again, uh, keep your finger there in Luke and go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Another Bible drill night we're going to have here. Romans chapter 5. Looking at verses 6 through 10. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth, showed us his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved through his life. Here in Luke 6, verses 27 to 36, during this Sermon on the Plain. Remember that? This is the Sermon on the Plain. Jesus announced a new law to his disciples to love as he loves. Remember what Jesus did? He just unloaded four bombshells on his disciples. Four. Four beatitudes. A blessing on poverty, hunger, sorrow, and rejection. 
Now, whenever Jesus speaks, it is explosive. Whenever Jesus speaks, it is radical. And whenever I think of Jesus' speech being radical, I think of John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. Now, that's, that's radical. <laughs> Always think of that one. It is explosive. That brings us to our first point tonight. The new love ethic declared. The new love ethic declared here in verses 27 through 31 of Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, 27. All words of Christ we're looking at here tonight. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. It's like, oh no, one, two, three, four. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. Him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. So the Lord Jesus just hit him with four bombshells, but he was not done. Here comes one more. He hits them with another bombshell. His teaching is like no other. No one ever taught like this. In verses 27 and 28, he delivers a hard-hitting truth. I want you to love your enemies. Now, I want you to, to, to think about that. Uh, this is a good opportunity with all the mess that's going on in this world. It, it's that we are to love those individuals in Washington. Many of them are enemies of the cross. They are the enemies of Christ. They are the enemies of you and me. We are to love them. Go back in your own life and think about things that happened to you and how you handled people who did things to you that were really not good and unkind things. What was that response like? Did you love them? Or did you hold that against them? Hold that grudge against them? See, as believers, we have to get to the point where we're just not going to do it at all. Not holding that grudge. We are going to love those. Doesn't matter what they did, we're going to love them. That's, the, that's what Jesus is ordering us to do here. It doesn't matter what they did. Think of Jesus himself from the cross. Forgiving the soldiers. Forgiving the religious thugs. Forgiving the whole world. This, what Jesus is talking about here is agape love. It, it is not one of the lesser definitions of love. Agape love is deliberate, it is willful, it is love by choice. I choose to love them. I remember uh, whenever that, the election was where it was, it was Romney and Obama. And Larry and I were on our way to, to Greenville for a seminar. And we were staying in a hotel overnight the night of the election. I remember that very vividly, you know, uh, and you all know who I did not want to be <laughs> elected. But how do I handle that? How did you handle that? Do you love President Obama in spite of what he has done, in spite of what he might be continuing to do behind the curtain? See, that's what Jesus is talking about here. It is a choice that has to be made. Agape love. It's, it's deep, continuous, growing, and ever-renewing, and it is directed by the Holy Spirit. It is a graced love that says, I will love this person. I will love this person. And Jesus doesn't stop there, though. He doesn't stop with that. He keeps going in 27b. Do good to them that hate you. Do good to them that hate you. Now, this is very unnatural to do this. 
The common unbeliever, no way. Not happening. This is a very unnatural love. And Jesus says that it can and it must be done. And then he says, bless them that curse you. Bless them that curse you. A little more uh, Bible drill. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. Here we got Paul repeating the same thing that Jesus said, Romans 12, 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. 1 Corinthians 4, 12. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 12. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. And one more. There's Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. I was thinking today as I was looking over this again, you know, Peter and Paul were a lot alike in some ways. 1 Peter 3, not both, they were both tough cookies, were they not? They were tough. But they came to the end of themselves as well and did what Jesus wanted them to do. 1 Peter 3, 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. You know, the Lord is going to reward you for obedience in this way and every way. You know, somebody, you know, when's the last time somebody swore at you? Now, I'm trying to, re I can't remember how long ago. That's been a long time. But somebody swears at you, what do you, what do you do? <laughs> I know you're not going to swear back. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to respond with heartfelt blessing. It's unnatural, but that's what we're to do. But Jesus is still not done. He's adding on to this thing, and here he has one more. Jesus is still, he's ready. He says, pray for them which despitefully use you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. Now, here's the thing. You can't pray for someone and hate them at the same time. Those two things can't happen together, can they? You can't pray for them while you're hating them. Why? Because you're living in sin. It <laughs> doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Again, this is not natural. It doesn't come naturally, but Jesus proved that it can be done. This is not a natural love, but Jesus calls us to exercise unconventional love. Look again at Luke 6, at 29 to 31. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them to do to you. So the pagan way was, you hit me and I will break your neck. You take my shirt and I will cut off your hand. I mean, that's the pagan way. Now, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament had some laws that were, were uh, meant to stop crime and bad things from happening, right? The Old Testament law was eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. Now, if we would get that going in America today, we could clean it up pretty fast. But we have sunk so far away 
from that that we are where we are today. These are civilized principles that would straighten our country out, our society out in a hurry. And I'm going to look at three of them quickly. Uh, first of all, Exodus 21. Exodus chapter 21, we find uh, these principles, these laws. In Exodus 21, we have verses 23 to 25, which say, And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. That tells me there were a lot of problems. I mean, th these are all addressed very specifically. Then you go to, to Leviticus 24. Leviticus chapter 24. Verse 20, Leviticus 24, 20, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done so to him again. And one more, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 19, 21. This is the last and the best. <laughs> Deuteronomy 19, 21. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That's the Old Testament. That is the law. That's what it was. Jesus, however... He's going to go a lot farther than this. What is Jesus saying here? He is demanding a loving attitude that is not vengeful, but generous and giving. The spirit and the attitude are the important things. It's what's going on in here. What's going on in here? If someone hits us because we are followers of Jesus Christ, what are we supposed to do? We are not supposed to retaliate. No. This is because of Christ. This isn't because of some skirmish I'm having with somebody, some problem. No. If someone hits us because we're followers of Jesus Christ, we are simply to not retaliate. Love is ready to give and give and give and give. It's the golden rule of verse number 31 in Luke 6. This is how we are to treat people regardless of how they treat us. It's a supernatural love made possible only through Christ because we are saved. We have his nature and we are following him. This is how we are to treat our enemies. Is this unnatural agape love possible? Yes. By God's grace, it is. Great story. When the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, remember that? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Ronald Reagan. Well, the wall came down, and the former communist dictator and his wife, everything was taken away from them, to the point that they were now homeless people. A pastor and his wife took them into their own home in spite of the fact that this dictator's wife's educational policies made it impossible for their 10 children not to have any higher education because they were Christians. Wow. By God's grace, this pastor and his wife loved their enemies, blessed them, did good to them, and prayed for them. They turned the other cheek. They gave their enemies their coat. How did they do that? They took them into their house. Wow! 
Now, before I preached, or before, yeah, before I prepared for this message, I'm not sure I would have done that. How about you? You got to hear from Christ first sometimes, don't you? Jesus says, what does he say? Yeah. Wow. They did to them what the enemy should have done for them. They didn't do it, but the pastor and his wife, they did. Amazing. Point number two, the new love ethic explained. The new love ethic explained. We'll take this in verses 32 to 36. Here Jesus explains his new ethic by contrasting it with the reciprocal ethic of sinners. First, there is no credit for natural love. There is no credit for natural love, verses 32 to 34. For if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them, what do good to you? Which do good to you? What thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. In other words, I'm good to them because they're good to me. That's how this life works. If they're good to me, I'll be good to them. That's what we do, right? That's, the, that's what it is. So Jesus is saying so much as, big deal. The sinners do that. What good is that? There's no reward for that at all. Even people like Hitler would do that. But secondly, there is eternal credit for the new love. There's eternal credit for the new love, verses 35 and 36. But love ye your enemies, and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. Jesus gave two points to the reward that he promises. Number one reward is, he says, your reward will be great, big, huge, outstanding. Love for God and for others has great reward. At the judgment seat of Christ, it's all coming out. That's where it's all coming out. Great will be the reward for loving others. Second, Jesus says, you shall be children of the highest. We then will be like the most high God. To love one's enemies is to be like Christ and like our Father in heaven. When that pastor and his wife took in that ex-communist dictator, who were they like? They were like Christ. They were children of the highest. They did exactly what Jesus would have right out of this text. How can any of us live up to this ethic? Well, in and of ourselves, it's impossible. It is impossible in and of ourselves. It's not happening. But because we have been saved, things are different and can be a lot different. We have become partakers of Christ's divine nature. His divine nature is at work in and through us. And by studying this text tonight, it's going to be greater. It is going to be greater. Christ's love that reached out to Judas has come to us here tonight. The key to Christ's moral teaching is Christ in us. We have the verse, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Our ethic 
can be radically Christ-centered. A missionary lady came home from the mission field. She had never had her own place before. And God graciously gave her a beautiful townhouse with a beautiful patio out back. And that became the center of attention. She had that painted up nicely and all the vegetation and all of that. It was absolutely beautiful. And the patio was the focus of the attention of her home. A short while later, she got new neighbors next door. She got a family from hell. That's what it was. These people were horrible. They played their music so loud it shook the building. The kids were always fighting. And then the kids got their hands on orange spray paint and went onto her patio and spray painted the whole thing in graffiti. Now, how would you respond to that? <laughs> well, first, she was distraught. She was furious. She was angry, and she was hateful. Can you blame her? Well, what did she do? Well, she thought about this, and then she sat down, and she got before God, and she said, How can I love these people? How can I love these people? Wow. Well, she did. She did it. She did exactly what Jesus said in our text, she began to bake cookies for them. She baked them pies and took nice cooked meals over to their house. She began to babysit those wicked wild children. And then she had the wife over for tea. She found out that this family had all kinds of bad issues. And God was able to use her to help this family to come along in their lives she loved them like christ would have loved them and when they moved away she wept why because she did what jesus said to do what if she would have responded the other way what if she would have been very hateful what if she would have been very mean to them what if she would have expressed that to them would their lives have ever been changed at all? Not at all, no. That missionary, what good is, was her, her God? She's a missionary and she reacted like that. But no, that's not what she did, no. If we consider ourselves true followers of Christ, then this will be our ethic. This is how we will live. We will practice Luke chapter 6. So we can ask ourselves the questions. Are you doing good to those who hate you? Are you blessing those who curse you? Are you praying for those who mistreat you in this life? This is a supernatural life. And the good news is for us who know Christ, it is possible. It is possible to live it. Remember the day when Jesus was teaching to the crowds of people and a large segment of that crowd turned and walked away. Why? These teachings are too hard. Can't do this. Well, most of them were not followers of Christ anyway. They were in the crowd. They said, no, we can't do but we're not like them. We have Jesus in here. Therefore, we can do this. We can do it. The difference for us is we are saved individuals. It can be done through the grace and the power of God. We can do this. Let us pray. Father, thank you tonight. What a text. It is rich. It's powerful, radical unnatural but it's supernatural and therefore as believers it can be done we thank you lord for your powerful teaching it was perfect it was right on spot on exactly what the disciples needed to hear exactly what we need to hear tonight 
This one little text could change this country if practiced by everyone who knows Christ. So we ask, Lord, that you might bring this text to the attention of your people here in America, all over. And may we here at Faith Chapel be able to make this happen in our own lives, in our own hearts, when these sort of situations arise. May we indeed bless and curse not. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.